Nicholas uh, Cipriani is, uh, was born in Brooklyn, New York. He's a veteran of the Vietnam War, and he's a natural storyteller. He has written eight short stories, and four of them have been published. We will be talking about his uh, short stories on two books that he has published, and they are A World Forgotten, and the other one is The Season Changer. I guess we will be putting it on in a little while. Uh, Mr. Cipriani, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Perhaps uh, our viewers should know that we are almost related. Almost. Yeah, my, my aunt's uh, daughter married a first cousin of first yours. First cousin, right, correct. And, and the strange coincidence, we met today for the first time. Correct. Emailing and, uh, and corresponding. Yeah, but personally. Personally, personally today. Where, where were you born in Brooklyn? Uh, I was born in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, DeKalb Avenue, in uh, 1943. There were uh, Italian immigrants there, Italian-American uh, families? Yeah, there were. There were uh, mostly Italian. Um, there were some German, uh, some Irish, okay. and black. And I imagine you went to school over there, right? St. Ambrose Catholic Elementary School for four years before we moved from there to Borough Park, okay. which is also in Brooklyn, uh -huh. different section of uh, Brooklyn. Yeah, I see. And tell me, did you start writing uh, when you were in high school? You went to college, I guess, a couple of years? Uh, uh, yeah, I started writing but quite by accident. 1978, uh, I was writing on the Northern State, going home in the heat of the summer, and uh, thoughts came into my mind. Uh, I couldn't figure it out, but they were coming so quickly. By the time I got home, I realized I had a story. But you had never written before. Never written before. And, and you were an adult or, uh, by now, right? Already. I was in my 30s. Correct. And you had all the profession, not writing. Not writing. Not writing. So the stories were telling you, here is something you can become famous on. Exactly. Uh, the story I wrote, uh, called A Message to the Children, uh, dealt with a paraclete coming to Earth, partaking of human activities, befriending a young lady with her rascal brother, and uh, going out and, and, uh, and intermingling with the public. I thought it was a winner. I mean, this was 1978. Nothing like this ever appeared on TV before in a series or in a movie or a motion mm -hmm. picture. I sent it out to all the publishers I knew. William Morris was one of them, and they all returned it. Uh, 1981, Michael Landon uh, produced uh, a, 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 a movie, uh, actually a TV series, a drama TV series called Highway to Heaven. And guess what? He was an he, actor, your story? He, he works for, he's like, he's uh, uh, under the auspices of William Morris. Yeah. He's an angel. He partakes of the activities of humankind, and he I meets see. this young lady and her rascal brother. I mm -hmm. said, what a coincidence. Well, your stories are, the way I see it, and actually they are powerful stories. Uh, in the beginning, you feel that they are religious or Catholic, let's say, story. But in fact, there is an art in writing, and in, in a way, I wanted to title the program The Storyteller, because I believe you're a natural storyteller. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And, um, so once you start, you start to write, you, co you continue to write, and you wrote the whole eight stories? No. Uh, once, once the story was rejected, a message to the children, and I saw this program on television, I lost heart. I lost heart completely in writing. It was resurrected in 1995. The same feelings, the same inspiration that hit me in 78 now recurred in 95. I couldn't write fast enough. I was writing two stories at one time. At one time. Tell me. In your background, is there something that tells you that probably prepares you for the writing? For example, mm -hmm. well, you were a teenager, imagine, young adult. Did you read? Uh, did you read stories uh, related to uh, mm -hmm. fables or uh, science fiction mm -hmm. or religious stories? Not really. I think uh, I, like any other child, um, use my imagination. I mean, I came home from school, I took a towel from the bathroom, I put it around my throat, and I was Superman for a while. I had a gun, and I went outside, and I was Roy Rogers or Gene Autry, I and G.I. Joe. So your background uh, doesn't indicate anything. No. The 
reading of stories, at least that prepared no, me for no, writing. No. How about the family? Is there somebody in the family that is the storyteller, the oral storyteller? Usually in the Italian American communities, yes. people tell stories. My father, my Your father, father, my father was uh, my inspiration and my hero. And even today, the older I get, the wiser he becomes in my mind. Uh, the man taught himself four instruments. He knew musical instruments. Musical instruments. He self-taught. Mm -hmm. Mandolin, the accordion, the uh, guitar, and uh, the organ. Well, did he, he tell stories? Did he? Uh, well, he told some stories from Italy, but uh, they they were inspiring. But they weren't in the in the metaphysical area. It was it was true life. It were hard, you know, tough luck stories. Uh, even his own life was a hard uh, luck story. Uh, from the reading, I find that there are some. It is a sophisticated writing. It is not just something that come. I don't know, you can write without having read uh, something. For example, True. the Bible's there, yeah. Dante is there. Absolutely uh, right. Some philosophers not are there. Not as a child, but as an adult. As sure, as screw tape, tape letters uh, by C.S. Lewis was a big influence. Joseph Campbell, uh, The Power of Myth was another influence. Uh, uh, Umberto Eco, uh, there's a number of people. Um, even, uh, even Eric Hoffa, The True Believer, uh, a lot of those books oh, so inspired you, you were me. reading. You were reading all along. I mean, around that time, yes, uh -huh. yes, around that time, sure. Well, most of the story, at least the, the bulk of the story, is storytelling of fables. You know, fables. It's a yeah. story that the animals or the plants or something talks and says things. So the scope is moral, moralistic in, in yeah. nature. Um, how how did you come about? Because it, they are such straightforward, very simple s writing, but yet it goes straight into the fable, into that fantastic or fabulous kind of uh, atmosphere or world. Yeah, the stories the stories just enter my mind, and then I start to elaborate, and I put in certain things that mean something. Some are imagination, some are fable, and some are truisms. There's generally a theme to the stories that I write. Uh, we have the uh, what if theme about Jesus, Pontius Pilate, having the opportunity to remove Jesus from the cross before he dies. There's the purgatory theme, where a man has an opportunity to go back to the Garden of Eden and, uh, and redeem mankind for the screw up from Adam and Eve. But yet, yet at, at the end, I don't have that feeling that religion is that pushes you to write. But the storytelling, the love of telling something. Yeah. Obviously, you use this the religious subject, but it is only a subject. It's not the force behind that. Correct. Because there are other stories that, have, you know, at least uh, that don't appear to be uh, Christian or right. religious Correct. at all. Right. Correct. Correct. No. Maybe you you want to tell us a little about how you came about the story of the uh, l the land of the God f forgotten. Sure. The land sure. Of that's God that's forgotten. interesting story. There are two themes. One is the uh, uh, the land, the gods forgot, uh, and uh, the other one is the, a brother's love. They're very similar in style because there is love of a sibling, and it amel ameliorates a condition, makes it better. In the land the gods forgot, it's a vapid island, a thousand miles from nowhere. The king rules with an a, 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 a iron fist. He tells the people when they work, when they sleep, when they eat, when they bury their dead, when they get married, when they must have children, he dictates everything. Boy, that's a and, and in that story, he has uh, elected two young people, just married, he calls them into his chambers and he says, now, a year from now, I expect you to bring me a baby. Can't do it, she's barren. But in a dream, she sends her husband to the other end of the island because in this cave, uh, is a is a pearl. Once she has a dream, she has the dream, and solves the problem in, in how to resolve the problem. Exactly. And so he tells the wife, uh, uh, the husband, what to do. What to do? He he goes there and he finds uh, it's always a journey and there's so always it's activity. Uh, he he con he's confronted with a dragon. Him and his horse overcome the dragon. They find the pearl, but by the time they get back, all bets so are the off. The order was to go and look for 
for the pearl. For a cave. A cave. Inside there's lots of gold, right? There would Which is uh, Aladdin uh, and the uh, 40 uh, right, thieves. Right, uh, yeah, yeah. right, right. Dragons, dragons in those days, they wanted virgins and gold, and neither one that could they do anything with. Uh -huh. Unlike the Chinese dragons, they're jolly. They have fun, but the European dragon doesn't. I see. So this fellow who is uh, you, Paul? You, Paul. The strange S names you use, yeah. uh, unusual names. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They just come to you like that? They or just come. Or it's, they a, it's, mean a, something? it's a relative of mine, you, Paul. You, uh, Paul. Uh, no, like his, his name is Paul. Uh -huh. the, the U I put in front of it to, to make, make it, it mythological. Exotic, right. Yeah. And, and Asher, 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 Asher is the lady, the wife. Asherah, right. Asherah is a religious connotation. Uh, in ancient uh, Hebrew, the consort of Yahweh was Asherah. That was his consort, the so female, the, the, the female goddess. So this fellow, you Paul, goes into the cave and finds what he's supposed to. A pearl. To he okay. finds the pearl in a mullox, a, mu a mullox, uh, like a clam. Yeah. And on the way out, the dragon comes in. So between him and the horse, they overtake the, the dragon, and they're bringing the pearl back. But by the time they come back, which is almost six or eight months, all bets are off. She's mm -hmm. not in the same condition he left her in. So this is the, the type of story where maybe the Lord of the Rings type of... Uh, similar. Similar. Uh, similar. Uh, you know, Too it's bad that the lady who wrote that <laughs> is in the millions. <laughs> and uh, you're still struggling. That was, that was Tolkien. That Henry, uh, Henry po Harry yeah, Potter yeah. is... Uh, but yeah. I, it's very similar, and it's something a, a young person, even myself, I enjoyed the, the story tremendously. Thank you. Thank you. But then you also have uh, all the story of uh, where you infuse the Greek mythology, Greek gods, uh, yeah. with the... Uh, yeah, with, uh, with the, uh, the, the uh, a merman. Yeah, the, the merman, merman. The merman. And that interesting story. Uh, he was actually half man and half fish. That's where, and at the end... He fell in love with, he fell in a, love a, with human. a human, with a human girl, and he didn't know that he had part humanity in him. He thought he was just a fish. He didn't know what he was, but as the story progresses, we find out that he's a uh, uh, son of uh, Neptune, which is the god of the sea, and a, and a, a human person. person. And then he finds that at the end, because of this character in him, he dies. He he's killed by. Uh, a shark. He's killed by a shark. Actually, he falls in love with the girl, right. and, and right. he's resurrected. He's resurrected through. Why? Uh, his tell us how is he resurrected. This is very classical uh, Greek. Uh, he dies in his father's underworld. Yeah, underworld, nether world, right? He dies in his father's arms, which is Neptune. Now, once he dies in his father's arms, it doesn't automatically go to uh, to Hades to to the portion yeah. of hell. So, uh, uh, Neptune brings him into this portion and, and, and meets and sees Hades, who was actually his brother, mythology, mythological brother. Yeah. And he demands that Hades resurrect his life, which he can. And Hades at first uh, has resistance. But Neptune says, if you don't, I will have all the water on Earth seep right through into your domain. We will drown you. And uh, uh, yeah, you owe me a favor. <laughs> hey, right, you owe me a favor <laughs> if I do this for you. Don't drown this out. And he does, and he becomes a person, and then he, he goes forward and he, he learns about humanity from the sage. Uh, uh -huh. There's another story. Uh, it's located in the Season Changer, which mm. is the, this book here, the Season Changer. Um, okay. What happens here? There is a, a lady has a problem with his son, with her son. Yes. Her son is in a coma, and it's directly related to the weather. The man, uh, the person that's causing this is called the season changer. And how he got his job was because the original season, season changer volunteered. When God created Earth, he put people in charge of time, gravity, and, and other things. And he wanted someone to take care of the seasons for Earth. And this angel volunteered. But after three, 4,000 years, he got tired of the job. Mm -hmm. He wanted out. And he realized, because he volunteered, that if he gets someone else to volunteer, he'll be out and they'll be in. And the way he did it was through the heart. He found a young boy that wanted his parents to live, but the heat was so grotesque, it was so unbelievable. Mm -hmm. He took the job. He changed the weather, made it cool. His parents lived for another 10, 15 years. And here the magic again appears. Uh, apparently, 
there's the story of the per the uh, the lady going into a bookstore and, and they offer right. somebody offers her right. a, a book. book. Right. He happens to be the season changer and himself. And the season changer. Human, right? In human form. And then form. when the lady goes to open the book, she finds that um, a vapor, a vapor comes out and puts and her. And the magic begins. And the magic starts. She falls asleep. Magic starts in dreams. A lot of things happen in dreams. In, in, in that dream, the the change from the real world that she was in with all the trouble and the child in, in the hospital, the dream immediately starts in a, it's not a fable, but now it's more realistic. It appe she appears to be in a winter in the uh, 18th century, right, sometime right, earlier. Exactly, exactly. In a wet, wet country. It, it could be, it could be uh, in New England, in New England century, states. New England states. Right, right. But Describe what a little the the town as she sees. Uh, it's a quaint town. The buildings are all the same and with smoke chimneys and they're having a wonderful time for themselves because she's made a transition. She's made a transition from the regular world into a world of euphoria, uh, utopia, uh, Shangri-La, where in this world there is no hate, there is no lie, and there is no competition. So without those things, you have only love, and the truth. And with love and the truth, they're very simple people. Mm -hmm. They don't need telephones, they don't need televisions, they're very simple the people. The dreams appear repeatedly in your books, um, but they're not regu regular dreams. They fall asleep and uh, you come up with a story, but this is a magic story. Something happens that changes eventually the real life. Yeah, yeah. How do you, did you get that point to ever say that a dream is not a dream, but rather is an extension of, re of reality or right, what could be. Right, right. There has to be a continuation of the story. And once it goes from the normal into the paranormal, there has to be a transition. So a transition is made, either you go up into outer space, or you go maybe into the earth, or maybe you go into yourself, into your own uh, su subconsciousness. Uh -huh. And then that manifests the change, and then the change becomes real. Only it's mythological, it's metaphysical, it's beyond its uh, ultimate reality. Okay, since we are now there, an ultimate reality or something other than the reality, your books are replete with uh, metaphysical aspects, of mythology. And even in fact, you say it's a, it's a collection of short stories depicting humanity's struggle between God and uh, good and evil, good and, evil right. uh, and so you go with uh, this world of mythology and religion. Mm -hmm. But there is one one aspect here that you say the imagination is like a house, and it has several rooms in it. Right. So imagination, human imagination, is a house, and mythology and metaphysics are two rooms in the house. Plus, there's another room. Religion is part of that. R religion, religion comes, in my view, from myth. Myth is considered the, the first religion. It's the ancient religion. And what myth is, is myth is the, uh, the forms and the metaphors of the metaphysical concept. What the, they thought of myth provides, myth manifests. If, if religion is a myth, therefore, is a poetical or li literary expression. Sure. It's a creation. Sure. That means then all religions are false. It depends on what you believe. It depends on what yeah, you believe. Yeah, this is what I like to, to arrive is that yeah. on one side you say religion is a false thing because it's, it's a, a product of your imagination. Therefore, it's not real. Metaphysical, on the other hand, it says that there is a, a something which is not real, but it's extra. Something could be there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you question religion as being a, a, authentic or not. But then your writing is Christian. You know, you talk about Christ, you talk about St. Paul, you talk about the church, obviously, a yeah. critic of the church, but still you do talk about uh, religion, uh, which you apparently believe in. Sure. I, I think. Is there a discrepancy, or how do you? combine those two? The one story that deals exclusively with religion is isolated. That's the Joseph story. 
the others make connotation to metaphysical beings and gods, but in Joseph's story, that's truism with some metaphysical connotation. The metaphysical connotation is this person comes to Pontius Pilate's house and that's asks Joseph. Joseph, he asks Pilate to release Jesus from the cross before he dies. And the reason is because he has seen the future. So he's explaining to Pilate all of these inhumanities are going to unfold if Jesus dies because Christianity will evolve from that. And we take the reader through the Inquisition, the Crusades, and the burning times. Does it, does it mean that if Christ had not been killed that probably we would not have a Christianity? Uh, wouldn't have Christianity, would have something else. I mean, at the time there was Mithraism, there was Zoroaster a little bit earlier than that. There were other religions. Uh, yeah, the Jewish religion. And the Jewish religion, and then you had, uh, uh, you had the Islam in 600 A.D. That was a, a concept of Judaism and Christianity. But the inhumanity towards man would never cease. Christianity tried to put a hold on it, and morally it was correct. I mean, look, Plato said 3,000 years ago, you know, there are a thousand religions today. Can all of them be right mm. today? In, in fact, um, you you criticize the religion the religion aspect of no no not the religion the, the religion institution the, the, the religion the institution uh, the religion the Christian institution while at the same time you do talk about Christ himself that he was love thyself and love thy neighbor but he was against in creating institution yeah while I instead the apostles did create an institution uh, which made billions of dollars or whatever it was. Uh, it w it uh, became a, a an institution. Absolutely, absolutely. Jesus Christ, I believe, did not want to have a separate religion. He wanted to make the existing religion better. And he was thrown out. The Hebrew religion. The Hebrew, the Jewish religion. He wanted to make it better. He said uh, man was not made for the, uh, the, sab the, man, the s man was not made to respect the Sabbath, but he could work on the Sabbath. The Jewish believe that you take the Sabbath off. You didn't work on that day. In the church, who was that person that basically said, we are a different, we are different people from the Jewish, we are no longer followers of the Torah, but yeah, something yeah. else? I, I think the, the biggest, the strongest proponent of Christianity was Paul. Not Peter. No, I believe he was Paul. Paul was, Paul was the man. And Peter. we have a, a story here about the Paul being basically the one had changed the Paul, Paul, Paul was the one in my view. And he was an anti-Christ. He Christ. was. Yes, he was. He was. He would find them and persecute them. And then how did it come about that he changed? He, he, was, he saw a vision. He saw a vision on his way to Damascus to crucify some more Jew, Jew, uh, Christians. He, uh, he came, the, the sky opened up and a voice said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And uh, he says, are you Jesus? And Jesus says, I am Jesus. And from that time on, his name was changed from Saul to Paul. And was then he became a, a proponent. Was this a was this? Uh, no, this, this, is, this was a reality. This was reality. So there come the church. The church. And he is the one. He is the biggest proponent of it. Mm -hmm. Now, it, we, we talk about the myth. Of course, the myth has to do with, as I said before, stories that... Uh, the gods are involved. If in religion we talk about the same or different gods or one god, it's basically the same story, right? So it's part of the myth, as you said before. Uh, there's no difference. In as far as, as not with uh, Greek mythology now. Greek mythology, you have a pantheon of gods. In Hinduism, you have a pantheon of gods. In Egyptology, you have, but in Christianity, we have we have three gods in the one Godhead. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That is something that the Jews did not believe. The Jews did not believe it. And other, believe it. other sects, uh, Christian sects, would not also believe that. But let, let us go now to a subject which you talk about strongly in this, is the eternal recurrence of life. Eternal recurrence, yes, yes. A man relives his life over. Is this something that you got from books or whatever, yeah, th learning? This, this is uh, Frederick Nietzsche. Okay. This is Frederick Nietzsche, and I just added a different interpretation to it, and I added a different thing. But this, this what I does got. it say? Because uh, you have a story here. But yeah, yeah. The story is that he, his life 
recurs. He dies and he's born. Mm -hmm. Five minutes later or a minute later or eternity, he's reborn on the same day that he was born, uh, October 26, 1939. And he dies uh, whenever he dies. And then he's reborn that day. And he goes through the exact same things every day until he dies. Every day the same thing. And the second life is, it, is it, identical? Identical. Spitzigagel. Identical. So what Doesn't is the purpose change. of the life purpose, then? The purpose of it is to break that, become your, your uh, have a, your own identity, a new identity that can do something different than that. And he finds that when he f uh, an, a, a recurring dream happens where he meets this demon in his dream. Mm -hmm. And the, the doctor that's talking to him says, here's what you can do. If you're dr see, because everything in life that happens happened before. And so it's different. It's so it's different. But in the dream, everything happens the same exact way. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. You get up in the morning, you miss your bus. You get up in the morning, you make your bus. You have coffee, you don't have coffee. That can change. But in his dream, everything is the same. So the doctor says, if you change the dream, you can change the eternal recurrence. It won't happen again. You'll be born again, and you'll live a regular life. But this is for each. That's for at, pretty, at pretty another point, you say God created the world uh, and uh, he and then man, and then immediately he saw that there was no hope for man. So basically, the devil and God just ran away. Ran away. They went away and left him. Ran man away. abandoned yeah. to itself. Uh, but then you introduce the idea of time, God. Yeah, it's through time that reality or movement or life can exist exist. exactly exactly tell so me a little bit uh, well about in, that. in my view uh, because there is time and because is because God is supreme God is part of time so God is always with us I mean we hear the religious say that God is always watching every move we make every thought we make the way in my view that can happen is if he is part of time so only through time there's life only through time. Uh, all right, so the, well, we have now sort of uh, arrived at the end of uh, the thing, the, the conversation, and maybe, I don't know if we, we, f we show this, the world forgotten. This is the world forgotten, uh, meaning the world that. world forgotten. Forgotten by God? Well, I think so, I think so. You can have your own interpretation. If, uh, if you say that it's God, ran away and forgot but once he established a time yeah then watcher then he's here then he's there it's yeah. only that he doesn't judge doesn't people. doesn't do anything mm -hmm. the deists believe and i have to subscribe to that is god put us on this earth even the uh, existentialists put us on this earth for us to to do what we must do we the way we behave is on our own like winding a clock Okay. Letting the clock run its course on its own. So it's it's time that determines uh, the will of God, but nothing else. And uh, unfortunately, we we reached the uh, the end of the conversation, and I uh, would like to thank you. My and pleasure. Uh, please uh, come back next time when we will have uh, another Italian American author.